dear guests and speakers, good morning, good afternoon, hello to you. My name is Krista Bombera, and I warmly welcome you at this session of the closing conference of the Research Facility on Inequalities. Our session now will aim to discuss inequality in Africa, building on the results of three studies conducted in Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. In this session, we'll have four speakers, each of them presenting for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a short coffee break at around 11.15, and then we welcome you all back to join our discussant, reflecting on the issues presented to us in the morning. At around 11.30, we'll have half an hour for questions from you. Even until then, I'll be able to ask some of your questions from each speaker shortly right after their presentations, but we will focus on more of your questions a bit after 11.30. We will have a Slido app available to put your questions and comments there and interact with the speakers. This should be to your right on the bottom of the screen. I hope you see it. And um, let us start now. Please use the Slido and let me first give the floor to the director of the institution that embraced and coordinated the studies that will be presented to you soon now. We'll start with Mr. Marie Lebrun, the director of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research within the African Research Universities Alliance. Let me short introduce Mr. Lebrun. He holds the National Research Foundation Research Chair in Poverty and Inequality Research. And he's also the director of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit in UCT School of Economics. Mr. Lebrant's research analyzes South African poverty, inequality, and labor market dynamics. He's one of the principal investigators of the National Income Dynamics Study, also a senior research fellow for the World Institute for Development Economics and a research fellow for the Institute for Labor Economics. Mr. Lebrun, it is my honor to welcome you to open the session. Thank you so much. I'm just waiting for my slides to be loaded. It's such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, my task is to introduce um, the importance of, of the African context in the global inequality discussion uh, also for better policy making in the African context. Uh, are my slides showing? Thank you so much. Okay. So my, I'm going to approach the discussion in, in three parts. Uh, one, I'm going to locate the, uh, the current uh, situation of Africa in the global inequality discussion. Um, how is it integrated into the raging discussion around global inequalities right now? And then I'm going to say, uh, but what can we say about African inequality uh, beyond how it's articulated in the global discussion? And then I'm going to conclude by saying, uh, why is this important? Um, it, it turns out that Africa needs to be more, more purposefully integrated into the global discussion. Um, it has much to contribute to that discussion because of the textures of our inequality and the growing role of Africa in the global drivers of inequality. Uh, there are crucial research gaps to fill. And the, in the rest of the session, my colleagues from the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research will show you how we've pushed on with that work. This is a very famous diagram uh, from Branko Milanovic, who was on the plenary panel last night uh, talking about global inequality and COVID. And uh, he, he made the point, and the whole panel made the point, that particular attention to Africa is even more important now in the current environment than before. Uh, this is a famous elephant diagram of Branko Milanovic, 
uh, it, uh, why am I including it here? It shows what has been the major drivers of global inequality uh, change over the last while and the contention that global inequality has fallen um, is, is represented in this diagram. It's fallen largely because countries have grown, particularly China and India, and so they have the rise in their incomes have pushed up the incomes and the hump of the elephant. Um, and it is and the, the top end, however, of the inequality distribution has also risen and flourished. The middle class has not. And right at the bottom, there's a, a note that says the very poorest are locked growth. Now, Africa constitutes a, a dominant driver of the countries, of the individuals that make up that lowest part of the, of the distribution. So I put up a, a graph here that's actually about um, poverty and world poverty. So, and you can see uh, the, the graph, the African curve is right up at the top. And it shows that the incidence of poverty is way higher in Africa than it is elsewhere, um, at above 50%. And it's come down over the, since the 1990s, but come down slowly. That's a key point. Africa has been part of the so-called growth miracle, uh, but um, it. Uh, it's, it hasn't translated into a massive reduction in poverty. So uh, why is that important for the global inequality discussion? Well, it's really important for Africa because that reflects uh, individuals who are stuck and locked out of the growth process to quote Milanovic. So it's really important to us, but it is also important to the international uh, global discussion uh, because as you can see on, on this graph, um, the, the, the point of the graph is to show that uh, world population will grow quite dramatically from 2020, which is where the, the, the line uh, represent is there. Um, world population will grow, but slow. But the major driver then is that bold line that's Sub-Saharan Africa. So Sub-Saharan Africa is starting to contribute a growing share of the growth in world population, and in particular, a very dominant share of the growth in the working age population in the world. So both uh, the fact that, that African uh, population is very poor, and so they're a very important focus at the bottom end of the income distribution, and the fact that they're a uh, an increasingly important share of the world population makes them crucial to the whole discussion around global inequalities. In addition, here is a, a graph that reflects inequality trends by region of the world. So by South Asia, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And you will know that Latin America is famously an unequal continent, if I can put it that way. The countries, the citizens in Latin America have high inequality. Note that if you pull all the African citizens together and you estimate African inequality, it's extremely high. Now, as we will show a bit later, that's not exactly an, a completely accurate representation across the continent, but it makes the additional point that not only uh, is, are the drivers of African uh, development going to be key to what happens at the lower ends of the world global income distribution, uh, but that there's very high pockets of inequality in the continent as well. So it suffers, as per the plenary last night, all of the consequences of a high inequality exclusionary society. There are pockets of Africa that suffer that too. Why is this important? Just to, just to finalize the point, there's a growing literature that shows that inequality as a reflection of the texture of a society translates economic growth into poverty reduction. It translates economic growth into development more generally. 
And this is the famous uh, triangle of Francois Boyguignard that just represents that. It says it has three legs, it has poverty reduction, it has growth, and it has distributional change. Now, understanding inequality and understanding how it works in any context is key to getting any development benefits from economic growth. It doesn't mean growth is not important, it's crucial, but to get the benefits uh, requires that you, you understand your inequalities. Okay, so what can we say about African inequality? Uh, there's been a flurry of important research. We're not the first people to realize the importance of African inequality. Uh, the, the picture just shows two major, two of the many major reports that have been produced recently on African inequalities. One is by the World Bank on the left, and the other one is by the World Inequality um, uh, Lab at the Paris School of Economics on the right, produced only in 2019, actually. And they use different data and they interrogate African inequality as a whole. Uh, here's, here's what we find, and here's why that picture of, African, of Africa as a high inequality context is not necessarily useful. The key point I want to table for this morning's uh, deliberations, or this afternoon for some of you, um, is that uh, given the data that we have, we can actually say quite a lot about African inequality. In, in the diagram on the left, the red uh, the, the colors at the bottom, you can, you can see Southern Africa as a highly unequal, very high uh, Gini coefficient region of the world. In fact, the most unequal subregion in the world. But you can see other colors reflecting lighter, uh, some quite severe inequality uh, in, in, in the dark blue, for example, on the left-hand side, um, but, but quite, uh, average inequality levels elsewhere on the continent. So it, it depends. But the point is that these two diagrams are telling the same story. We can say some things about African inequality given existing data. What can we say? Well, here's just a quick summary of what we can say. We can say that our, uh, some of our contexts are extremely high inequality global contexts off the charts to quote Thomas Piketty when he was talking about South Africa, taking us into untold territory, but nonetheless. So all of the concerns about high levels of inequality are African concerns, but that's not even across the continent. Different countries have different levels of inequality, different textures to their inequality, and there's a lot of variation that's very important to understand at the end of the day. There's also differences in the trends in inequality. They've changed differently across the continent. There's been some increases. There's been many countries that haven't made any progress. Their levels have stayed constant. Um, uh, and there's been other, there's been one or two countries that inequality has fallen. Okay, so let me move on then to, to quickly review some of the recommendations then. Um, what have we learned then? from our more detailed interrogation and summary of African inequality. There's a working paper that we've produced reviewing, the, this presentation comes out of a review that we undertook. Uh, it's uh, by Ander David, myself, uh, and Amuna Shifa for the African Center of Excellence. We, we look at the detailed literature and we can say some things about African inequality that turn out to be really important in terms of the texture for, for global inequality, actually. So just to raise a few key points, intra-household inequality and gender and age are very important to understand. What goes on inside the household, the social relations, if you're really going to tackle inclusive growth and include women and include youth, in the processes of growth, you have to understand how these social relations work in, in any African context. They're not the same in every African context, but predominantly they discriminate against youth and against uh, women. And it's crucial to understand that 
if you're trying to really do something rather than just say something. Two, uh, we, we took a close look at the patterns of social mobility and the story in the African continent is very sluggish social mobility. It's very hard to change who's getting ahead and who's falling behind. There's a bit, we're stuck a little bit. And understanding the distribution of wealth and assets is crucial to that story. But it's not necessarily the wealth and assets as they are uh, it, in the focus on the top 1% of the income distribution. It's wealth and assets that, that are crucial to people's livelihoods. So for example, really understanding land, is it communally used, which it is in many African countries? What are the rules of inheritance? Can women own land? Can women access land in their own right? These, these are as important aspects of understanding the role of wealth in the replication of inequality and uh, in promoting, breaking these cycles as, uh, as understanding the very top end of the income distribution. It's not saying the top end is not important, it is. Uh, African contexts make it very clear that we have to give great attention to um, the rural-urban divide. The way labor markets work in any African context requires that we give focus to, to what's really going on in rural labor markets, what's really going on in urban labor markets, and the interaction between the two. It's not good enough to just talk about the labor market if you want to understand the role of labor markets in inequality. And so the linkages between them are very important. So these are very key uh, contributions to understanding African inequality but they are also very, very important contributions to the global discussion because it's not just African context in which these factors are important, it's developing country contexts. And so bringing Africa into the global discussion will also strengthen the, the prioritization of developing country issues in the global inequality discussion. So just concluding, substantively, this is not just about measurement. This is about uh, intervening to break the cycles of inequality, to promote inclusive growth, to make growth more poverty alleviating. That's why we have such a focus on inequality. It's completely in line with the SDG processes. There are important uh, data and knowledge gaps, and we'll hear more about those in the ASA presentation, but ASA has started very important country specific work and that's where it comes home that's where policy is made and and that's what we need to understand so that by way of context then to the remaining sessions thank you thank you mr Leverand. let me hold you with us uh, for a couple of questions that came in already on slido by members of the audience let me ask you one, uh, you talked about a lot of factors that play into the problem, but can you dwell a bit more on the colonial legacy of inequality that shapes still today's inequalities? And can you please provide us a few examples of that? Yes, uh, that's a very, very good question because obviously inequality, the process is generating inequality even now bear the burden of history. And so that's what your question is directed at. And so Africa was in, incorporated into the world e economic system in, in ways that weren't to promote the development of African contexts. They were to promote the development of the colonial uh, powers and the global economy. And that's still the case to a large extent. What is the footprint of that? Um, which was your question. Uh, some of the, the most unequal countries in the, in the world, as I showed you on the map, are the Southern African countries. They are all uh, mineral exporting, mineral dependent countries that were articulated into, into the colonial system in order to produce minerals for others. And, and with little regard to the benefits spreading to the rest of their, their citizens. And so that's a very tangible uh, global commitment. Um, 
uh, and, and, and the world economic system has not just evolved innocently, it still bears those burdens, right? Uh, in, in the World Trade Organization negotiations, it's very, very hard to get a, a, an African voice in there that says, please, can you focus on our distorted legacy that we're trying to, to rectify? And it feeds right into the texture of the societies. Uh, to give you, obviously, I come from South Africa, a, a country that's, that's steeped in this, this global uh, this colonial legacy, but it's a legacy that will that then was built on. Uh, it was a, a legacy that that was racially exclusive, and ethnic and around the continent ethnically fragmenting. That is the colonial legacy. In South Africa, we then took it to uh, a, an obscene level, apartheid system, and and ran with that, that. But it was a legacy of colonialism. That's the point. That colonialism leaves a legacy of fragmentation in societies that are very hard to, to unbundle, but the focus on inequality is in a crucial place to start. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Lebron, for both your presentation and your answer to the question. I'd like to inspire and urge the members of the audience to put in more questions. We already have a bunch, um, smart and important questions that I'll have a chance to pose to the speakers and presenters uh, later on too. I'd like to have you back, Professor, at around 11.30 for further questions until noon. Now let us turn to our next speaker, Mr. Vimal Rancho. Mr. Rancho is a professor in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town and the Deputy Director of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit. He obtained his PhD from the University of Michigan and works on labor markets, education, and poverty and inequality. Please welcome Professor Rancho now. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So I yeah. Shall you just give me one second? Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't want to give me one second. Okay, I got it. Um, okay, thank you so much. And as we've been introduced, I'm just going to jump right in. So what we're looking at here are the three country studies with really cool uh, covers for inequality trends reports from the three countries in our center of excellence, which is the South Africa, Ghana, and Kenya ones. Um, and that was from Murray's. <laughs> okay, right, so here's my slides, thank you. And I'm going to talk about the work that the South African team or the South African node in the Acer has been doing over the past few years. So, oh wait, what happened? Okay. So, wait, wait. Um, how do I send to myself? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, in our project, we've had four different outputs, and the first was a handbook. And in our handbook, it's kind of like a methods document. And we used it, it was written by Muna Shifa and myself. We used it as a guide to inform all those inequality trends reports, which were on the last slide of Murray's talk. So that was more of a stepping stone in this project to help all the different countries write their country reports in a way which was coherent and cohesive across the different countries so that we could enable some degree of comparability. I'm not going to talk much about that because it's a methods piece, not an output. Not, we're not focusing on the results in that case. 
And then the second thing that we did was an inequality trends report, which was a joint project between us and AFD and Stats SA, where Stats SA is our national statistical organization. Then the next two, the last two deliverables were two research papers that we wrote. One was on estimating the lifetime earnings inequality in South Africa, and I'll talk about it in a minute. That was between Rocco Tizamia and myself. And the other paper is by Muna Shifa, under David and Marie Lebrandt. And they were looking at code vulnerabilities and in particular the spatial distribution of vulnerabilities in South Africa. So some background and context, as Marie has already said, South Africa is widely acknowledged as one of the most unequal societies in the world. And it's not just in terms of income, it's in terms of, it's a multidimensional phenomenon, meaning that you can look at several different measures of socioeconomic development or welfare, including education, including income, including access to services, including access to clean water, to sanitation, to electricity. And you'll just keep finding that in several different ways, South Africa is extremely unequal and these inequalities compound each other. So the people who struggle to access clean water also struggle to access good schools and electricity, et cetera. And so the, once you take a multidimensional view, it becomes a lot more of a social policy issue and an imperative in fact. So we have, in terms of history, as Marie's already said, we have a long history of dispossession and discrimination by race. And we can conceptually think of the colonization, which was followed by apartheid, as very strong inequality enhancing policy. So these were policies which aimed to entrench, enhance, and cement the inequality of the society. And that's kind of a historical background with a long history, which is quite deeply embedded in our society. So it helps to keep that in mind when we think about contemporary studies of inequality in South Africa, because several of the social dynamics and institutions that matter for inequality today have their roots very, very long ago. And that's what we mean by it's a structural inequality in the sense that individuals acting by themselves are very unlikely to be able to change these dynamics because there's institutions which perpetuate them. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk in detail about any of the papers because they quite a bit of stuff in there, but very quickly and briefly in an overarching sense. Um, from the inequality trends report, we find that there's very high levels of inequality in multiple dimensions. And the largest contributor to income inequality is arising from the labor market. So in the labor market, there's two different dynamics that play out. One is who has a job and who doesn't have a job. And South Africa has one of the highest, if not the singular highest levels of unemployment in the world. So for all countries where we have reliable data, I think we do have the highest unemployment rate. At present, it's about 40% amongst adults. So part of the inequality is just who gets a job and who does not get a job. And then a second part of the inequality is about the earnings distribution amongst the people who have a job. So for example, the people who earn in the bottom half earn much, much, much lower wages than the people in the top 10%. Even if you did this, I mean, this is true in every country, but it's much more, that magnitude is much bigger in the South African context. And to further understand this, a large, an important aspect of these inequalities in the labor market can be correlated with race and gender. So the graph on your right hand side is one of the unemployment rate by race. And sorry, the legend got cropped out, but the highest line is for black African South Africans. And the second highest line, the yellow orange one is for colored South Africans. And then much lower, the one at about 10% is for Indian or Asian South Africans. And 
then below that in the gray is the line for white South Africans. So if you look at the unemployment rate for African South Africans, which where I mean the first African is a race and South African is a nationality. Um, that's between the age of 30%, whereas for white South Africans, it's about five to 6%. So that's a five times higher unemployment rate amongst black Africans relative to white South Africans. And this is what we mean by a large part of our unemployment rate is first of all correlated with race, it has historical roots, and it manifests through the labor market in terms of who has access to jobs. There's a second graph, which I'm not going to show, but it's in our paper, which shows then the distribution of wages by race. And you'll see that what it shows is it's compounding this picture quite dramatically because the wages for white South Africans when they are employed are several multiples higher on average than the wages for Black African South Africans. Okay. Okay, the next paper that we look at is the one by Muna Shifa and Anda David and Marie Lebrand. And they use the 2016 community survey, which is a fairly large household survey um, run by Statistics South Africa. And they created a, an index for vulnerability to COVID-19, right? So those six questions are the questions that we used and they were coded based on a priori assumptions about how the disease would spread. So for example, people who have to share water sources, they don't have taps inside their own home would be more vulnerable to exposure. And people who have to share toilet facilities, again, it's a similar type of thing. Large households would be more at risk for COVID. And then there's a demographic component, which is about household structure, which is relating, do you have elderly people living in households with younger people together? So they created this index and created an average vulnerability score by region. And so what we're gonna see next is a mapping exercise. Okay, so this is kind of, I think it's cool. Um, at least it looks cool. The first graph on your left-hand side is at the state level or province level, we call them provinces, um, where we have nine provinces in the country. And so the color coding going from light yellow up to red shows the degree of vulnerability by province. And what you'll see is that the two richest provinces are the one in the center and the one at the bottom left, that's Gauteng province, which includes Johannesburg and Pretoria, and is almost entirely urbanized. And the bottom left is the Western Cape, which includes the city of Cape Town, and it's one of the other wealthier provinces in the country. Whereas the poorest province, or one of the poorest, is the Eastern Cape, which is next to the Western Cape, and in the center it's the red, and has a much, much higher degree of vulnerability to COVID infection. Now, perhaps more informative is the second graph, which is the same logical structure of the graph, except that the units of analyses are much smaller. They're at the municipality level, and there's about 250 municipalities in the country, slightly more, maybe 255, something like that. Um, and here, what you see is that there's quite substantial spatial variation in vulnerability. So it's not like the whole of the Eastern Cape is vulnerable. It's not like the whole of KwaZulu-Natal, which is the province above the Eastern Cape is highly vulnerable. What we know and what is harder for someone who hasn't been working on South Africa for a while to see is that these areas correlate strongly. They're almost a perfect overlay with what the old apartheid government set up as African homelands. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the place just north of, okay, there's the Eastern Cape, which includes the Transkai and the Siskai historically. 
And then the northern parts of KwaZulu-Natal are the other large red groups there. And so these were areas which are set up almost intentionally to be relatively poor labor reserves where people would live. And then when they were in their prime, they would move to the cities or the mines or the farms to work, and then they would go back and retire there. And so that overlap of lack of infrastructure combined with high levels of poverty kind of just at this moment in time now come up again and reinforce inequalities in terms of risks to um, a health crisis. Okay, and this is a scatter plot which just kind of draws a trend line through it to look at the municipality's wealth index and the vulnerability of the municipality. And you find this very clear negative sloped line between the two. So the wealthier municipalities have much lower levels of COVID vulnerability mm. on average. Okay, the last paper that I'm going to speak about is the one by Rakhul Tizamiya and myself. And this was, in some, to some extent, an exploratory paper where we wanted to think about inequality, but over the course of a life cycle. Now, this is conceptually quite different to anything we've done in this country before, where most of our studies historically have been, what is the inequality at a moment in time, right? So an Gini coefficient typically, if you're using a cross-sectional data set, is going to give you the inequality in some variable at this moment in time. So it's a static measure. There's two reasons why a life cycle approach or a dynamic approach will matter. The first is that people find jobs and people lose jobs. And so to the extent that people find jobs and lose jobs, Sometimes I have a high earning job, then I lose a job and the person who's unemployed finds a high earning job and then they lose a job. Then maybe over time, it might become smaller because we're sharing jobs. But what is empirically more likely and we know from the previous studies is that the people who find and lose jobs fast tend to be low wage earners. High wage earners have much higher degrees of employment stability. And so that dynamic may be inequality enhancing even over time. The second issue is that to some extent, inequality at the moment in time reflects these differences. Young people enter, they have a hard time entering and we know this, and then they find a job at some point and then they will just go up on average as they become adults and as they acquire experience and as they enter management positions. And then later on, as people retire, their income tends to drop a bit. Right, and then at retirement, it could actually drop quite a bit. So there's a life cycle dynamic, which is a different aspect to inequality. These are all different. They all account for inequality, but they're different. And so what we did here is we used longitudinal data from the National Income Dynamics Study, but the, and this is only nine years long. It's got five waves. And so we wanted to think of conceptually a life cycle. How much of the inequality is because of age differences and how much of the inequality, if we could imagine a person's life cycle earnings would still be manifest. And so what we did was we matched people from different cohorts based on their demographic characteristics to create a synthetic panel. So, Here's the kind of endpoint of the exercise. If we look, if we look in the first three rows in this table, then we're excluding the unemployed people, right? So the Gini coefficient in the NITS cross sections is 0 0.53 over the period 2008 to 2017. If we just use two waves of the NITS panel, so we're getting to a slightly longer dynamic measure. Then, and we take the average income, it goes up to 0 0.57, 0 0.59. Now what's happening there, it's going up because of that issue which I raised, the possibility, which is that the low income earners tend to have greater job instability. So for example, think of one person who earns 100 euros 
one person who earns 10 euros and one person who's unemployed. And then a year later, the two people, the zero and the 10, swap with each other and the 100 person again earns another 100. So those three people over two years, their incomes are 210, 10. And because the top person has the job stability, they're pulling away from the group. And that's why the inequality is going up in that horizon. Eventually though, when you take a whole life cycle, it starts to go down because at least some of the young people will grow up and earn the high wages. And so it drops to 0 0.42. So it's much lower in a kind of life cycle sense, but by international standards, this is still really, really high. Um, 0 0.40, especially if you think of a life cycle inequality measure. The other ones, the 90-10 ratio or the 90-50 ratio, they all go up again from cross-section of 12, then it goes to 17, 23, 27, 30. And again, in, to some extent, that's just again reflecting that um, the churn, the churning is happening in the bottom half of the distribution. That's the kind of key takeaway, which means that the high earners who have the stability are just pulling away there. It changes a little bit when we look at the zero earnings people, because now you have to think of people who are unemployed as part of the distribution. And so in the zero earnings group, the inequality goes up quite dramatically if you compare the 0 0.8 at the bottom there to the 0 0.53, because there's a whole lot of zero earners and that large number a large mass point on the zero level is because of our high unemployment rate right so we gave a zero earnings to everyone who's unemployed and what we do find there is that it does go down very slowly as we get more and more waves because some of the people who are unemployed today have a job in two years time and then they lose a job and they find another job and so there's fewer and fewer people who are unemployed over five waves as compared to only one wave and so that measure does go down, but quite slowly over the, um, the course of the actual panel. And then over the, the synthetic panel, it goes to 0 0.42. That by construction has to be the same in the top row and the bottom row. Okay. Uh, recommendations. Um, I was quite conservative. I said, well, we don't really have any silver bullet um, recommendations, as we said, both Murray and I, the inequality is structural and it's deep rooted and it has a very long history, it has centuries of build up to it. So we don't have easy solutions to it. Um, we do think that having good data is clearly a good idea and having research capacity that can focus on these things is important. Um, and we probably do need to think about policy, which includes politics and political economy, um, and think about the dynamics of inequality. So that's pretty much all that I have to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And I would also like to um, thank members of the audience for the smart questions they have been submitting to us through Slido. We are watching them, collecting them, and we'll try to present them. Uh, Mr. Rancho, let me ask you for uh, just a short clarification concerning your analysis, your method. Um, you talked in depth how unemployment is one of the major factors of inequality, about the earnings, vulnerability. And let me ask you, when you talk about low wages, do you talk of formally employed people earning low wages or informally employed too? Are they included in the analysis? How are they if they are? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So both in theory are included in our surveys. We do less good of a job, less well. Job is done less well for the informal sector workers because they're informal sector. But the, the surveys do try to capture them. And it's we, we measure better the employment side of the informal sector than the earning side. But all the informal sector workers, well, overwhelmingly are low income. So you're not going to make a massive error on inequality studies because of that, because 
even if you get it slightly wrong, they're still going to be clustered at the bottom of the income distribution. And then the low, there's a large fraction of formal sector low wage earners as well, quite a large fraction. Um, and in part, it's because the South African wage distribution it has this really, really insanely long tail, upper tail. It just keeps going and going. And those are kind of your formal sector professionals and business owners and people in finance, like high skilled workers at the top end have done really well. Well, it's a story which is common throughout much of the world in the last decade, actually, that highly skilled people, the premium has gone up and up and up, whereas everyone else has relatively fallen behind. Thank you very much for both the presentation and the answer. I'd like to remind the audience that there'll be more time for the professor to answer questions a bit after 11.30 today, when our panel is joined back together for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce to the audience, Mr. Robert Osei. Mr. Robert Darko Osei is an associate professor in the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research at the University of Ghana, Ligon. And he's also the vice dean for the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Ghana. His main areas of research include evaluative poverty and rural research, macro and micro implications of fiscal policies, aid effectiveness, and other economic development policy concerns in the countries of Ghana, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali. He is currently the country coordinator for the African Center of Excellence in Equality Research on Ghana Note. Thank you very much for being with us, Mr. Osei. Yes, you are unmuted. Now we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so I'm waiting for my slides to come up. Yes. I wonder if uh, Mr. Osei can hear us. It seems to me that he is a bit frozen, but that does not mean that we are not trying with our team to get back him on the virtual stage. Um, he's been with us fine so far. I saw him in the backstage. So thank you for your patience. Sorry about um, the hiccups happens to any conference in the last year that we've been living like this. Okay, oh yeah, he's got disconnected. We're gonna work on getting him back. Um, but now I would like to move on um, to our next speaker, Mr. Damiano Mandakulundu. Let me introduce him shortly. He is Associate Professor of the School of Economics at the University of Nairobi. He holds a doctorate degree in economics from Gothenburg University in Sweden. And he had done his master's and undergraduate degree in economics at the University of Nairobi. His area of research is development economics focusing on labor markets, poverty, and inequality. Mr. Manda is a researcher at the African Economic Research Consortium, and he coordinates and carries out research at the African Center of Excellence in Inequality Research Node at the School of Economics at the University of Nairobi. Professor Manda, the floor is yours now. Thanks for being with us. Okay, thank you so much. Um... I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm going to present uh, 
this report on inequality trends and diagnostics in Kenya uh, 2020. This is a, a joint a report that was done by a team from the University of Nairobi, including Professor Mwabu, John, uh, Moses Moraidi, Anton Wambuku, and uh, Ruben Muteki, and also a team from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, including Paul uh, Samoy and uh, Samuel Kiprut. So as a way of uh, introduction, uh, we know that uh, there are previous studies that have been done uh, in Kenya uh, on inequality, but inequality uh, in those studies was not the main issue of study. So this report provides a comprehensive analysis of various dimensions of inequality trends and diagnostics in Kenya. And the analysis is done over a period of uh, 20 years using nationally representative some, uh, surveys. Uh, that is the period is from 1994 to 2016. And we use welfare monitoring survey 1994, Kenya integrated households uh, budget survey 20, uh, 2005 stock six, and 2015 stock 16. And then this is supported by um, uh, data from the population census uh, 2009. And we also use a uh, labor force survey 1998-99. Uh, 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 the report estimates a range of inequality measures. Of course, I have identified the measures here the Gini coefficient, uh, Palma ratio, uh, of course, Atkin, Atkinson indices, Thales indices. And we also use uh, descriptive measures, especially looking at the proportion of accessing uh, basic services. Then the, the analysis is also done at the national level, uh, regional level, that is rural urban, and county government level or county sub-region level. Then it's also done for subgroups, uh, including gender, by education and uh, poverty. So the report analyzes monetary and non-monetary dimensions of inequality. Uh, so we, we look at per capita expenditure inequality. Uh, we also look at asset inequality based on uh, asset index that is based on household possessions. Uh, inequality in the labor market, looking at uh, participation uh, by gender, uh, unemployment rates and real earnings. Then we also look at inequality in uh, social domain based on access to education, health, and basic services such as water, sanitation, electricity, among others. Then we also uh, uh, have a section on that is based on gender inequality. Uh, so we will be talking about this, uh, the various sections of results. Uh, so why would one be interested in reading this report? And we think that uh, uh, the interest in the report is based on its contribution and uh, policy relevance. Uh, we know that the report uh, provides the first comprehensive report on multidimensional measures and diagnostics of inequality. That is over time and space uh, in Kenya. And then uh, from a policy perspective, uh, the report uh, substantially improves the reporting and monitoring on UN SDG 10 on inequality reduction. And we know that uh, Kenya is among the countries that adopted the SDGs in uh, 2015. Uh, then 
it the report also informs uh, policymakers on possible interventions to reduce uh, inequality and therefore enhance social in, uh, cohesion and uh, boost economic growth. Uh, in terms of results, we first of look uh, we first of, of all look at uh, averages that is the mean and the median that is the real mean and median of annual expenditure. And here, our results show that uh, uh, urban dwellers, those who stay in urban areas, uh, receive high, had higher real mean uh, annual expenditure than uh, those in the rural areas. Also, those staying in Nairobi, which is the largest city in Kenya, had higher annual mean and median expenditure compared to the rest. Uh, and this was at least five times more than uh, many other counties. Um, but in 2015, 2016, uh, there was a redistribution of expenditure share uh, from the top 10 richest to the lowest percentiles. And this will show itself, especially when we look at, uh, when looking at the measures for inequality. Uh, looking at per capita uh, consumption expenditure inequality, uh, our results show that uh, inequality in consumption expenditure uh, is still high, but it declined in 2015 uh, relative to uh, 2005 and, uh, and, and uh, 2005 and uh, six. Uh, then a larger uh, decline record is record, recorded uh, for male-headed households than for female-headed households. Also, this larger decline is recorded for uh, those uh, living in the urban area than those in the rural areas. At county level, um, there is a wide variation. There is a wide variation in inequality across the counties, uh, ranging from 0 0.27 to 0 0.559. Um, the inequality also declined in most of the counties, but it rose in a few others. Uh, for example, in Nairobi, uh, had the highest decline in inequality. And one of the counties, uh, Turukana, uh, experienced an increase in uh, uh, inequality as shown by its Gini coefficient. Uh, also, there's high inequality in urban areas uh, uh, and among the non-poor and also among households whose heads had higher education. In terms of uh, uh, trying to see the contribution to this inequality, we see that the within inequality, that is within group inequality, is the main uh, contributor to inequality as compared to the between group inequality. And among the within inequality groups, uh, individuals in male headed households contributed more to the within. Uh, inequality. Also, individuals with primary and secondary education contributed more to within inequality. As well, uh, rural dwellers also contributed more to the within uh, inequality. In terms of uh, asset and uh, land ownership inequality, first of all, we see that uh, uh, about 2% of the households uh, lack very basic uh, assets. That is the distribution of assets. Uh, uh, if we distribute how, uh, assets across households, we see that 2% of the households did not own any of those assets that we looked at. Uh, these assets are mainly household possession uh, 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 that we looked at. Uh, and on average, uh, household assets increased uh, uh, minimally 
uh, from six uh, from six as the number of assets owned by houses to about seven as the number of assets uh, owned by a household in 2015-16 uh, as compared to 2005. Okay. Then inequality in assets, asset ownership index, uh, and also in land ownership are very high. And we think that as, uh, this could be some of the sources that uh, contribute to high inequality in Kenya. So inequality in asset and uh, land ownership could be contributing more to um, uh, inequality. In the labor market, we see that female and youth uh, did not have access to decent jobs and, 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 employ and, and, and unemployment was high among this group. Also, women had relatively low earnings across the earnings distribution compared to men, and that real earnings uh, worsened over the period uh, 1998 to 2005, but improved uh, uh, to some extent in 2015. Uh, the inequality in real earnings, uh, which was at uh, 0 0.49 to 0 0.9 are higher among those, uh, are also higher than those in uh, real per capita consumption. So again, we see that uh, earnings in the labor market could be another source that is leading to higher inequality in Kenya. In the social domain, uh, we, we the report shows uh, increased access to basic education, but with a large gender gaps in uh, tertiary education. Also large population share, that is uh, over 70%, uh, that is poor, non-poor, rural, urban dwellers uh, seek healthcare in uh, public facilities and education that probably there is an increase, an improvement in uh, quality of uh, healthy uh, health services provided in these facilities. Uh, there's a substantial increase in uh, number of households accessing safe drinking water and uh, waste disposal facilities and improved sanitation over the study period uh, with marked inequalities across groups. But high proportion of households without access to basic services, especially in rural areas and also in arid and semi-arid areas. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of counties, there's a large disparity uh, in access to the services. That is access to improved sanitation existed 90% in areas like Kisumu and uh, Nairobi, uh, which was 15 times higher than uh, in Wajir, which is at 6%. Uh, in terms of gender inequality, uh, as we have seen in the labor market, uh, male participation is higher than uh, for women, uh, unemployment is higher for women than for men, and men receive higher earnings than women. In education, especially in uh, higher education, there is gender uh, inequality. There is, there is gender inequality, especially in college and uh, university, but uh, in the basic education uh, sector, uh, there's, there isn't so much gender disparity. Then male-headed household, uh, households had higher access to safe drinking water, piped water, and improved sanitation than uh, the female-headed households. And also we see that representation of women in various legislative bodies was below 10% which is uh, uh, which is an indication of male dominance in uh, those areas. Conclusions. Uh, the main conclusions uh, from our study is that multidimensional inequality decreased over the study period, 
but remain high across regions uh, and social groups with some regions being severely disadvantaged, especially counties in rural and uh, arid and semi-arid semi areas. Um, gender inequality gaps narrowed, but remain high in uh, rural populations and in higher education and in civic engage engagements. Uh, uh, our recommendations are that uh, reducing inequality in labor market earnings and in asset ownership through fiscal measures could go a long way in reducing the overall inequality and poverty. Um, the reason why we we talk of fiscal measures is that we have a second paper which is uh, which is uh, on fiscal incidence that is already done it is uploaded on the cq institute and also aft website uh, and this this report uh, uh, has indicates that um, uh, this report shows how a uh, government can use uh, expenditure and taxes to uh, reduce uh, poverty and uh, inequality in Kenya. Uh, <clears throat> in increase, another recommendation is that we need to increase access to safe drinking water, sanitation, electricity, and internet, especially in the rural areas, and more so in the arid and semi-arid uh, areas. We also, another recommendation is to eliminate all forms of gender inequality in tertiary education and in other spheres. We also recommend that uh, we need uh, to increase the periodicity of uh, household budget surveys. For example, collecting data in a uh, five year cycle instead of the 10, current 10 years, and probably launch final data survey. Uh, this would help in uh, monitoring and reporting these uh, uh, measures. Also enhance collection of data on time use data and uh, data on nature and quality of the services accessed, especially by individuals and uh, uh, the poor. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, that is uh, the end of our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Manda. And I already found a very good question for you from a member of the audience. You talked a lot and in depth about gender-based inequality, but the question posed to you, addressed to you is the following. How do inequality dynamics affect youth and children differently? Okay. Um... That is not, uh, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, cut out this, that study in, uh, uh, we, we didn't cut that dimension of inequality in the report. Uh, but uh, uh, inequality would affect the youth and children in uh, various ways. For example, if, um, if um, a family is, uh, is poor, that is has low income, then it's most likely it is uh, likely to be uh, uh, poor, and therefore it will uh, it will face various measures of uh, uh, inequality and uh, poverty, which means uh, even children from those households may not uh, from households that are of low income may not get good education and um, because they may not access good education and uh, health uh, and health uh, services it means that they will end up remaining in that uh, poverty cycle if nothing is done uh, or if the if no intervention is done uh, uh, from the government side Lucky enough, a uh, government is doing something, especially uh, sending transfer earnings to households that are um, poor and the individuals that are, 
especially children that are orphans and that uh, is trying to help but we don't know the extent yet because we need to too much more on that uh, to be able to understand the situation uh, clearly thank you mr manda for your input and um hope to see you soon again for more q a and now i have the great news that mr osei is back with us so he'll be our fourth speaker of this session I already introduced him before we lost him. Let me just repeat the fact that he holds several positions at the University of Ghana, and he's currently the country coordinator for the African Center of Excellence in Inequality Research on Ghana Node. Good to have you back. Thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hopefully um, the internet will not um, let me down now. Okay, so I will wait for the slides to be uploaded and then get Okay. So um I am going to speak on uh, two research papers that um, we have worked on over the last uh, couple or so years, and it relates to uh, trying to understand the dynamics of inequality um, in Ghana, but also looking at this um, relationship between economic inequality on one hand, and then um, inequality of opportunities on the other hand, and how that um, feeds on themselves to either perpetuate or reduce um, economic inequality for future generations. So um, I think that the story about Ghana is well told. Um, in 2011, uh, with the discovery and indeed um, the start of production of oil in commercial quantities, um, the growth in Ghana, which was already quite high in the 2000s, actually shot up quite a bit, um, particularly um, in 2011. Um, and indeed, um, even though we had some bubbles um, from then, um, between 2017 and 2019, um, we've seen this reemergence of the growth uh, in Ghana. And indeed, uh, the African economic outlook indicates um, and that's uh, between 2017 and 2019, Ghana was uh, one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. Um, but unfortunately for Ghana, um, and I think for quite a number of countries in the developing world as well, um, the inequality uh, or the growth hasn't always translated into significant uh, poverty and inequality gains. Of course, for inequality, it is particularly problematic uh, because um, growing inequality has the tendency to potentially undermine um, social cohesion within the country, um, exacerbate social tensions, and therefore uh, make worse the, the nexus between growth and poverty that uh, Mari uh, referred to earlier. And so what our first paper attempts to do is to try and then understand the dynamics of inequality. Uh, and in particular, we take advantage of uh, panel data uh, that we have for Ghana for households surveys between 2010 and um, 2014 to try and then understand the dynamics of inequality for households that are moving away from, if you like, the average income band or level, um, what are the reasons and what are their attributes? And for those that are moving in a positive um, direction with respect to inequality, what essentially um, are the characteristics of these households? Um, so um, generally for Ghana, um, the inequality diagnostics report show that um, the growth rates actually were associated with declining poverty, which is a good thing on one hand, but um, that didn't necessarily translate into reducing inequality. What it then means is that even though growth had actually happened, not all benefited 
uh, from this uh, growth. And in particular, we see that the increasing inequality also is more pronounced um, in the regions where poverty incidence tends to be quite high. Okay, and if you look also in terms of the socioeconomic communities, access has also not been um, generally same, and indeed access seems to be worsening for um, a section of uh, the Ghanaian populace. So both in terms of um, the, if you like, the consumption inequality and uh, the socioeconomic indicators, uh, you do find that inequality has actually persisted in spite of the growth and poverty gains that the country has made over the last few years. And I'm um, sorry, so I think my slide went back. So like I said, the first research paper attempts to try and then provide a good understanding of the dynamics of inequality by exploring, exploiting this um, panel data that we have to try and then tell or tease out what determines micro level um, implications of uh, inequality um, for households. Um, and indeed, what we also go ahead to do in that research paper is to try and then identify correlates of poverty and inequality and then match them in a way that we are able to tell those indicators that drive both poverty and inequality in a direction that is favorable for development generally. So we, using those um, panel data that we have that exists for us and exploiting um, the deviation of households consumption from some average and the notion being that once a households or on average, if households are moving from that average, then typically you would say that these households or inequality is actually increasing. And so we then do our estimations and then um, come out with some findings with respect to um, inequality. First, in terms of increasing inequality, what the results do show is that um, the gender of the head of the household does matter in terms of uh, increasing inequality and in particular um, being uh, the head of household being male actually increases inequality, increases the relationship with uh, increasing inequality. Also, uh, we find that high dependency ratios also tend to increase um, inequality. On the flip side, in terms of decreasing inequality, uh, key correlates include the marital status of the households, um, low dependency, which is uh, the other side of the high dependency result that we found for increasing inequality. Uh, but also very interesting uh, um, indicators such as the education levels, where we are finding that higher education actually implies uh, or has uh, positive implications for reducing um, inequality, but also unemployment uh, or the employment or labor market outcomes and formal social safety nets all have, um, if you like, positive implications for uh, the fight against inequality. Um, of course, the findings also show heterogeneity, particularly with respect to um, the localities, whether they are rural or indeed um, urban um, households. So interestingly, we are finding essentially, I think, uh, uh, and this point needs to be made, that if you take the two um, objectives together, i.e. Um, reducing both poverty and inequality, there are certain correlates that um, goes with these. So if you wanted to achieve the twin objective of reducing inequality and at the same time reducing poverty, then your best bet in terms of what the data suggests for Ghana 
uh, higher education, um, labor market outcomes in the form of uh, employment and formal social safety nets. And when I'm discussing the next uh, research paper, um, you also find that indeed these um, indicators or correlates also appear to feature quite prominently in terms of the results that we find there. I will speak to what the policy implications are, but if I may, let me go to the next research paper and then discuss the results that we find there also. Now, this paper or research um, work looked at inequality of opportunity and how that relates to uh, economic inequality. And our premise was essentially um, that if you have economic inequality generally, it can perpetuate um, it can perpetuate future inequality by depending on the type of environment that you find yourself in with respect to inequality of opportunity. Um, and indeed, for inequality of opportunity, we know that inequality uh, can be sometimes based on factors that are beyond an individual's control. And so that is essentially what the inequality of opportunity is referring to. Uh, you can think of the gender, um, race, um, the um, occupation of parents, uh, social sort of standing uh, within households, uh, ethnicity, um, the locality. And these are not choices that um, an individual makes right from uh, the beginning of their lives. So you are born in uh, South Africa or you are born in Ghana, and you don't have a uh, sort of uh, um, control over that. However, where inequality is based on the capabilities of the individual um, or the choices that one makes, then indeed the individual can then change their welfare position uh, because it is in, to some extent in their control. Okay, so that type of inequality is quote unquote um, desirable because the individual can affect um, or can affect um, that uh, outcomes in terms of inequality. Of course, the inequality of opportunity or the one that is beyond or outside the control of individuals is what one then will seek to use policy to try and then influence if possible. So in this research paper, um, what we try to do first is to try and understand whether the inequality of opportunities is important in explaining um, the total economic inequality in Ghana using both the 2010 and then 2014 um, data. Then we also try to understand what factors then drive or influence the inequality of opportunity in Ghana. And then at the third stage, we then investigate how inequality, economic inequality affects education outcomes. Because again, based on the premise, we believe that if economic inequality will perpetuate um, in future generations, one of the surest routes will be through education. And so does economic inequality influence educational outcomes for children in households in Ghana. Okay, so the main results here um, are as follows. Now we do find that um, the inequality of opportunities um, has contributed significantly to total inequality in Ghana. Um, indeed, between 2010 and 2014, it has almost doubled. And so by 2014, it was around 8% of total um, inequality. Um, the main drivers of inequality of opportunity in Ghana, um, locality does matter, where you were born, region of birth, uh, but also the educational attainment of parents. And so the more educated your parents are, um, has implications for your inequality of opportunity, um, but also um, the social dimensions within the households 
whether both parents are present in the households, um, the type of school that the child um, ends up attending. Uh, of course, the gender and the region of residence are all important in driving inequality of opportunity in Ghana. Now, in terms of the link between economic inequality and education outcomes, we find that for Ghana, the data is showing that um, economic inequality negatively is associated with um, education outcomes. And indeed, the inequality of opportunity tends to, or is the main um, drive through which uh, the economic inequality actually affects um, education outcomes. And so uh, inequality of opportunity tends to be quite important in explaining what um, the differences in ed education outcomes are. Again, if, if, if you remember the premise that I actually started with, um, the idea being that if indeed economic inequality negatively is affecting the educational outcomes of children, then you are not likely to see improvements in um, um, improvements in inequality over time, because we know that the educational outcomes do affect uh, labor market outcomes, and that, uh, like we have seen and heard um, in Bimal's presentation, that has also implications for um, economic inequality. So, what do these um, findings of these two research? Uh, mean in terms of uh, policy. Now, in terms of understanding the dynamics of inequality or what drives um, the inequality in households, we did find that the correlates where we uh, are concerned about reducing both poverty and um, inequality, the key correlates are education, employment, and then formal social safety nets. And so clearly the policy message there is that if you really want to deal with this situation or improve the outcomes, development outcomes with respect to not just poverty, but also inequality, some more attention needs to be paid to education. Mm -hmm. Of course, some more attention needs to be paid to formal social safety nets and indeed uh, we need to uh, make employment policies more explicit uh, so as to deal with not just uh, reducing poverty, but also uh, reducing inequality. In terms of the inequality of opportunities and how that relates to economic inequalities and therefore how that either perpetuates or um, helps reduce uh, future inequality, economic inequality. Again, the uh, policy message is quite similar to that of the dynamic um, inequality uh, paper in the sense that, again, it means that there is the need to improve access to education in all um, the regions so as to improve um, the link between economic inequality and education outcomes. And like I showed, the results do show that actually the link between um, economic inequality and education outcomes is largely through inequalities of opportunities. Okay, so in large part, what this will suggest is that policy has to focus on trying to reduce some of the elements that are outside the control of households and creates inequalities um, within um, the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Osei. Um, in your presentation now, you've talked extensively of the importance of education, but let me quote you a very good question from a member of the audience. Can you please expand a bit on the policy options, especially with regards to the spatial determinants? of inequality, please. 
So thank you very much. Um, and like, like I, I was pushing and trying to drive home, um, education does matter irrespective of whether you are looking at the research paper one or research paper two. Now, clearly if education does matter in terms of perpetuating inequality, then it is not just about getting people into the classrooms, but the outcomes. And it's why we actually tested for the link between economic inequality and education outcomes and not just education outputs or inputs. So it was not just about enrollment rates, but it was actually um, math and English uh, tests for uh, children in a specific age cohort. And so the point about spatial dimensions is that um, largely in the relatively well off parts of the country, and that is probably more urban areas, you tend to find that there are better educational uh, facilities, access, okay, and therefore, in terms of inequality, these people are likely to, in the future, do much better than those who are less deprived in terms of education. And the access is not just about whether um, there are facilities or not. The access relates to whether there are good teachers or adequate teachers, whether they have uh, all the sort of uh, inputs that they need to be able to get good education in the less deprived areas of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Osei. And of course, I warmly welcome you back soon for more questions. But let us now have a strictly five minute coffee break, if you don't mind. Please do not sign off so you won't have to sign back in. Just take a break and have some rest. And we are ready to start with our discussion, Mr. Cecile, Mr. Cecile Baladier in five minutes. See you very soon. Thank you. From, From AFD, Agence Agent Française de Development, we, we want to tell, tell you what the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequalities is, the projects we are carrying out, and our main research findings. The EU AFD Research Facility on Inequalities is a program funded by the European Commission and managed by AFD, aiming to improve knowledge and understanding of economic and social inequalities, their determinants and underlying mechanisms at different spatial levels, as well as the most effective policies and approaches to reduce them. With a budget of 4 million euros for the period 2017 to 2020 and a steering committee comprised of the European Commission, AFD and AECID, the Spanish cooperation, the programme launched more than 20 research projects in over 20 countries. This facility also aimed to engage in a joint reflection with member states on ways to strengthen the contribution of EU development cooperation to the fight against inequalities in the framework of the implementation of Agenda 2030 and to contribute to EU development policy whose overarching objective is the eradication of poverty. The objectives of this facility are achieved through a three-pronged strategy. 1. Conducting research on the determinants and dynamics of economic and social inequalities in developing countries. 2. Targeting our work in partner countries that have expressed an interest or need. Three support partner countries and development institutions to integrate research findings into national policies and development cooperation strategies. Did you know that the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequality has produced over 100 research papers and policy briefs? All these articles analyse the links between inequalities and a wide array of topics such as education, health, labour markets, housing, taxation and climate change. These research publications, the support to the structuring and the strengthening of research networks on the topic of inequalities, further supports policymakers and development in mainstreaming and tackling the reduction of inequalities in their policies and strategies. 
However, the main point we would like to share with you is that we have observed how generalized are the effects of inequalities for societies, how unequal access to public services lowers the willingness to pay taxes, how unequal access to stable jobs creates poverty traps and exclusion, and how inequality shapes perceptions and the willingness to cooperate. So, how can we help strategies to reduce inequality? Through the development of new tools such as the inequality diagnostics, and the expansion of existing tools such as the Fiscal Incidence Analysis and the Multidimensional Inequality Framework, the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequalities supported the governments in partner countries and the civil society in building evidence-based strategies to reduce inequality. All these results have been presented at conferences such as the 2018 International Conference on Inequalities and Social Cohesion, in national workshops and stakeholders' events, such as those organized in Bolivia, Mexico, Tunisia and South Africa, in a series of webinars organized in 2020, and of course, in this final conference. In this final conference, beyond the presentation of all the results of the facility, there will be an opportunity to launch a second phase of reflections and partnerships that will be articulated in the extension of the facility over the period 2021 to 2026. We will be supporting four countries, Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico and South Africa to design and implement policies to reduce inequalities. Will you join our goal to reduce these inequalities? Help us share the knowledge on reducing inequalities. Good morning, good afternoon, hello everyone. Good to have you all back for the concluding remarks by our discussant and for the Q&A session where the floor is dominantly yours with all the previous speakers of this morning's session. I would like to welcome Ms. Cecile Valadier for her concluding remarks or rather a short discussion in a minute, but let me introduce her too shortly to you. Ms. Valadier is the Deputy Director of the Economic Assessment and Public Policy Department at the Agence Française de Développement. Before that, she was a Senior Economist for the World Bank in the Credit Risk Department, monitoring the macroeconomic and financial situation of emerging and developing countries. Before joining the bank in 2012, Ms. Valadier had worked as an economist in the Research Department of AFD. Good to have you with us, Ms. Valadier. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, and uh, thank you for all the presenters today. Um, I enjoyed a lot uh, listening to their presentation. Thank you for this chance to have um, a discussion with you about your view on what we've just listened to in the previous hours. But let me first ask you a bit about AFD. Would you please highlight to us what a development bank such as AFD does exactly 
to support knowledge on inequalities in Africa? Thank you for the question. So first, maybe let me start with the um, AFD's overall strategy. And it is quite clear actually on Africa, we need to do as much as possible for Africa, given our financial capacities and within the mandate that is given to us by uh, the French government. And Africa very much lies at the heart of our activity. Uh, for instance, more of more than 500 um, staff work there. Uh, we committed 6.5 billion euros on the continent in 2019, which is closely half to what we have been financing for development purposes. And beyond this, this financial support, our research um, and no innovation and knowledge strategy also aims at making sure that 90% of all our research projects have at least one partner in the global south. And this ambition echoes um, Murray's earlier remarks, but it goes beyond, beyond the research on inequalities. And at AFD, we have the privilege um, to act as a bridge between academia and the policy making process. But we also have a role in, to play in building the research capacity in our partner countries. And this is why we were really honored to be involved in uh, launching the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research together with the um, African Research Universities Alliance and the three universities in South Africa, Ghana and Kenya. And even though the lines are slowly starting to change, um, most of the research on development economics is still being conducted by researchers that live in high income countries. If we want a research to be relevant for policy making, it needs to be local, locally grounded. And that's what we aim to do. Um, inequalities are increasingly at the center of development strategies. And what we know about inequalities mostly comes from high and middle income countries. So we need a local take on what types of inequalities really matter, how local institutions shape these inequalities and what policy should be used in African context. What we see in African countries today is that local experts are not always involved and consulted in policy process. Uh, and this policy process still also involves international consultants. And while we recognize the importance of research in the North and, and of bringing different views to the table, we, we think that supporting local research capacities with, will also enhance the policy process in African countries. Thank you very much. Um, let me also ask you um, your opinion on how specifically do you think the findings presented here today feed into the AFD strategies and operations? So first, all the results that uh, have been presented and the recommendations as well from uh, these research projects will inform our country strategies. Um, this kind of research allows us to have in-depth understanding of socioeconomic issues uh, in, in these countries and to adjust or support accordingly. The inequality diagnostics, for instance, they allow us to identify which type of inequality are the most significant, where they are concentrated, and who is the most vulnerable from them. They also allow us to have a baseline against which we can measure the impact of our support. This, this type of, uh, of research program also gives us a factual basis to, that we can build upon to start a policy dialogue. In South Africa, for instance, the inequality diagnostic was launched as part of a stakeholder engagement on inequality, which brought together um, actors from the government, from the civil society, from the private sector, and from other uh, donor countries, in order to discuss the findings of the report and to reflect together on potential issues. And today, we are also continuing the conversation with some of these participants on how we can take effective actions and support policies in order to reduce inequalities. And finally, I would say that um, what is really remarkable with this kind of uh, projects is that they, they allow us to engage with different counterparts than the one we usually talk to. You know, as a donor, we, we often engage with uh, departments that are in charge of international co cooperation or external funding uh, within the ministries of finance, conducting rest research projects such as these allowed us to engage other stakeholders within governments, people, for instance, who are in charge of planning, strategies, or research. And it broadens the, the different takes we can, we can take into account in our operations. How do you see to be the next steps 
in terms of research on inequalities in Africa? So this is broad, <laughs> but um, I would say maybe first, because I'm a macroeconomist, that um, at the macro level, we, we still do not know enough about our structural changes, like the one we are currently witnessing, uh, will impact inequalities in Africa. For instance, um, we are starting to see evidence on how digitalization uh, impacts labor markets and wages. But we, we still don't know what this impact would look like in a country where 90% of the labor market is informal, like it is the case in Mali, for instance. So that's one area where I think we need to, to learn more about what's, what these structural changes are in, um, in Africa and, and what does it do for inequalities. In terms of statistics, I think I, I speak for many researchers in the field when I say that we would also need more panel data in, in African countries in order to be able to capture the dynamics of the earnings distribution. We have very few countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have panel data. And as we saw today with the presentation of the work in Ghana or South Africa, these are really valuable in uh, understanding inequality. Third, I would also mention the need for us to better understand the perceptions of inequality. Uh, we know that perceived inequality is what really matters for social cohesion and it goes as far as uh, to matter for, for instance, for tax compliance. But little of this evidence that we have is coming from African countries. And this is really important for, to understand both the for the poor, poorest or the richest um, in the, in, and, and we think that we know quite a lot about subjective poverty, for instance, but we cannot say the same for the upper part of the income distribution. Um, so the question we should ask ourselves are, who consider themselves uh, rich? Um, where, like, do, how do they see social mobility? Are, are they the, the, are the richest seeing themselves as are as um, middle class or, 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 or more than that? And these are important questions because economic inequality comes with political inequality. We know that it is often the wealthiest who will weigh most on the policy decisions, and so that's that's one uh, part of uh, the research agenda that I think would be very promising in in a way. And this brings me to maybe the last point I wanted to make on, uh, on where we need more research on, which is the political economy barriers to um, inequality reduction and the policy implementation. So the, I think the last panel of the conference will shed some light on this issue, but we need to better understand why policies, which are generally well designed to reduce uh, inequalities, might not achieve their goal. And actually, I'd be interested to hear uh, um, from Murray on this topic, if he has some insights to offer uh, with the case of South Africa in particular in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me uh, take advantage of, um, of what you just said and let's engage Mr. Murray Lebrand in a conversation with you. Let's change the format a bit and let us have both of you on the screen now for um, a short conversation. Hello, Mr. Lebrand. Yes, greetings. And all the other speakers as well. Thank you very much. Let's open the floor for questions and a conversation with Ms. Veladi now. Would you like me to respond? Yes, please. Only if you want to, Murray. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be a pleasure to respond. Um, yeah, thank you for a very, very good input. Um, and. Uh, uh, it's, uh, let me just say as an initial response that, uh, that somebody who thinks that inequality is very important to understand the actual context in which uh, even a development bank like AFD is seeking to make an investment. If even infrastructure, what, you know, you have a whole menu and at the end of the day, the country will flourish if the infrastructure opens up opportunities for the citizens of the country. And, um, and so we've had a, quite a lot of discussion this morning, for example, about the urban rural divide and the spatial and structural factors. And that, those aren't just words, they mean things, right? They mean uh, uh, about if you're in a rural village that has no access for, to the market and, and no good roads and no, no access to good schools, 
that's a very different situation to where government invests in that particular environment because of its perspective on citizens and inequality and, and empowers the people of that village to actually develop themselves. Um, and so uh, the AFD has always been quite remarkable in, in that sense of actually wanting to ground your investments in, in, um, in things that empower the citizens to develop themselves, to increase their productivity, to, uh, which is exactly what inequalities and a focus on inequalities brings to, uh, to the development perspective. It makes you focus on actual livelihoods, how they're really working and what can you do to unlock the potential of people. And so, um, uh, and, you, and, and your comments imply a, quite a sophisticated approach um, that I want to acknowledge. For example, your comments about stakeholder engagements and your question about political economy. Um, well, the very fact of producing some evidence, but then using it to broker it as a platform for a richer engagement, not just the usual suspects, not leaving it up to your usual um, uh, ministries that you usually engage with, but actually having an engagement with, with the Planning Commission, which was the example you used, or the Ministry of Finance about how, why is it allocating its budget like this when, when the country actually looks like this? You know, um, I think uh, it's, it's, it deserves strong affirmation because it's a type of a partnership that shifts the dial. It, it, it enables the country to actually move on to saying inequality is important, to actually making the discussion more inclusive, which is the very start to, to grounding your policies better for, for, uh, for inequalities. And so I think your political economy point, it's very hard. For, for a group like the AFD or for a bunch of academics to actually think that you're changing policy. But there is a political economy to the type of engagements that you have um, that are very, very important. And so I think that your point, I'm not answering the big political economy question, uh, but I think that the way you proceed, uh, where we proceed with our research and the way that, for example, Robert and, and Damiana were describing that we use our research to broker broad stakeholder engagements. That is so symbiotic with what uh, AFD has done in its own approach. Uh, and so, and, and, and so that, that might seem like a small step. It's incredibly powerful because it invites people into the discussion that are otherwise ex excluded. Thank you. I would like to ask Mr. Osei to comment. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to comment uh, briefly on the political economy dimensions to dealing with this inequality challenge. Um, I think that there is a fundamental problem and with respect to policy making, um, like we have all alluded to, policy making is a critical part, an integral part of the solution to the inequality problem. It will just not happen. Uh, and therefore, policy has to be deliberate in driving the change that we want. But the question is, who sets the policy agenda? If it's political elements only that sets the policy agenda and it's in a way that only favors uh, the elites, then you would have a challenge with respect to um, using policy to drive um, um, the change that we require. A recent report um, by uh, the UK uh, DFID, um, which looks at uh, the role of evidence in policy setting in a number of countries, for instance, is showing that evidence is only used when it suits the political actors. <laughs> okay, so if evidence is only used in situations where it suits political actors, then even the evidence that we are producing, like the inequality evidence that we are showing, the fact that there are large discrepancies that are partly even driven by inequalities of opportunities and therefore there is need for policy to try and address these. Now, if it doesn't favor the political elements and the political agenda, then that gets pushed 
unfortunately to the background. So policymakers need to increasingly appreciate that evidence is critical in policy making and indeed they need to also appreciate that the economic outcomes also do matter for political outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Say. I would like to ask Ms. Valadier if she would like to comment or react. No, thank you very much for, for these answers. And um, um, I think that's what we are trying to do. Um, and it's a small step as uh, Murray uh, said, but uh, we, we do think it really matters uh, to, to have this broader discussion and, and to gather together people around the, the research results and, and, and to keep the conversation going on what they mean and, and what are the policy implications that uh, can be driven from them. Thank you. And now I think it's time to have you all back on stage for the questions and while you're gathering, I see you all. I just wanted to quote you something that's so connected to what Mr. Osei just said, how he finished. It's more of a comment than a question. Um, a member of the audience says it would be very interesting to see how we can make use of this research and tools on inequalities to better assess the effectiveness of public interventions and eventually provide evidence for adjustments, just like Mr. Osei said. Um, let me start with a question that was posed to you a long time ago in this session. And uh, please feel free to, for any of you to answer. Do you think that landed redistribution could work to deal with inequalities in Africa? land redistribution is the focus of the question. Marie? Yes, uh, I'd be very happy to kick off that discussion. Uh, Thank you. It, it's a crucial uh, part of the discussion. I think people that want to duck the issue, it, it resonates with my point earlier about the fact that you, if you want to talk about the importance of wealth and how wealth predetermines your trajectories in life, um, then in an African context, land and access to land and ownership to land is a key asset. And, um, and, and it links to the point that was made earlier about the history and colonialism, the, the ownership patterns of land in any African context don't just pop out of thin air, they pop out of a very deep history and it's not a history of inclusion and empowerment. Um, and so if you're not willing to talk about that distribution of land as an issue and take stock of it and look at who, who's using the land for what and whether we, you know, uh, um, then, then I don't think that you're seriously willing to confront the actual constraints on people's livelihoods. That doesn't say that we're interested in any particular type of land redistribution or any particular type of land reform. It just means that it has to be part of the discussion. Um, it's, uh, but it's quite an important discussion uh, in which evidence can have a huge impact on what comes out on the other side, because the push for land redistribution comes, sometimes comes as a cathartic response to our history. Now that's not very helpful necessarily to, uh, to rural uh, dwellers or urban farmers or et cetera, uh, informal settlement people. Um, they need well-designed policies in which land is a part of that discussion. Uh, so I think that it's unavoidable. I, th I, I think you really do need to take stock of, of, the, of the use of land um, mm. as part of the discussion, uh, but that doesn't necessarily lead, it requires local specificity, mm. uh, serious analysis at the local level. Thanks. Mm. Thank you very much. Let me ask the other participants if they'd like to comment on this. If, if not, oh. I see uh, Mr. Wanda just started to answer, muted though. Maybe not, then let me move on because it's a very important other question that we have. One of the main factors of inequality you mostly mentioned was locality. And the question is, if you think that urbanization can help reduce poverty and inequality, 
um, the importance of urbanization is the focus of the question. Mr. Van Schell, maybe? Thank you. Sure, thanks. So, I mean, based on our data, I think that it definitely is the case that people who migrate to cities or urban centers do better economically in terms of poverty and a number of other developmental uh, yeah, welfare indicators. The, but at the same time, you, you end up with uh, the rural areas falling further and further behind. And so there's two dynamics at play. One is for the individuals who go to the cities to the extent that the cities can absorb more and more people. And certainly in South Africa, we're seeing an increased trend over the last 20, 25 years of urbanization and better opportunities for the migrants into the cities. But it, it generates a different tension at the end of the day as well, because that small population has a greater and greater chance of getting left behind. So if you recall the maps that I showed of the South African case, all the areas in red are very poor and almost without exception are rural both in terms of um, like they're poor, but they're also poor in terms of infrastructure and connectivity and several other things, access to clinics, access to water, electricity, et cetera. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, let me please address Mr. Manda now um, about the next one. How relevant do you think subsidies are for inequality and poverty reduction, especially in the context of limited fiscal space? Okay, uh, maybe I start. I, I actually wanted to contribute on the issue of land, but I was muted. So oh, I okay, not. thank you. Yes, so let Go me ahead. start from there. Yeah, so I think uh, deal, uh, dealing with the issue of land redistribution is uh, useful uh, in terms of improving inequality. In Kenya, we see uh, there was high inequality in terms of land ownership. Uh, around ranging from around uh, 0 0.7 so that is very high and it it means <clears throat> we have people who are unemployed who are uh, landless and if you have landless in a, a country like ours uh, where issues of um, uh, contract farming are not so clear then it means if if you are landless and you are not employed then then you don't have any other means of livelihood so i think land redistribution is key and uh, uh, i know this is a big issue in kenya and uh, it has come up uh, several times uh, uh, the political will to address it uh, moving slowly on the issue but again, in terms of redistribution, there's another issue on uh, the issue of land. That is when land is redistributed into very small units that are not um, uh, economical uh, for, for, for its use, especially in the rural areas where population is increasing and um, land, that is arable land is becoming uh, scarce. So the issue of land, is key uh, and if we address it especially in kenya i think we can address uh, most of the issues we see on uh, inequality on the issue of uh, subsidies yes i think it can work if if the subsidies are directed in the right um, uh, if the if, if the beneficiaries of the subsidies uh, those with a low income but in most cases when you look at subsidies it tends to end up in uh, the hands of those who already have high income for example if you are looking at issues of subsidies on fertilizer uh, to support maybe smaller farms uh, it ends up benefiting also uh, those who are already uh, rich so th there's no way of um, there's no mechanism of uh, trying to differentiate 
uh, between uh, those whether the rich and the poor benefit from this subsidy because you it may be put we may put subsidies in place uh, trying to support the poor but it ends up uh, uh, supporting uh, um, the rich what i see in kenya that uh, has worked i think the issue of uh, targeted uh, uh, cash transfers has helped in terms of uh, both uh, improving on inequality and uh, and uh, poverty because then the cash is given to those who deserve and like subsidies which is very hard to control who the beneficiaries are thank you Thank you very much. Thanks for the input. And unfortunately, now the end of this session has arrived, but by far not the end of your work. Thanks for everything that you've done so far and that you will do. Now, I believe it's time for the members of the audience to get to know each other, uh, to use the next two and a half hours to rest a bit and to network. There's a networking uh, tool on the conference platform that you can use for this. And the session named Inequality Drivers starts at three this afternoon. A lot of the questions that we haven't been able to answer now will be answered then. And parallel with that, we'll have a session that I'd like to welcome you back to our session named Tools, also starting at 3 p.m. today. Thank you very much for being here with us. Have some rest, have some food and drink, and have some fresh ideas and fresh personal connections. Hope to see you all back soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.